topic which I'm going to discuss right now has never been broached before to my knowledge. But you know, we all... Now I'm speaking for myself, but I think I can speak pretty much in general about this. The Mona Lisa smile. We're all trying to recapture that incredible smile that our mamas gave us when we were born. I think it became a living, vital, vibrant, obsessive engram. We never got over that shock. Of course, I'm hypothesizing now, but I think I'm onto something. We all want, we're all looking to recapture that type of confirmation. Call it romance call it whatever you will good example of what I'm talking about I'm thinking here of uh, Carousel and Music Man with the great Shirley Jones who was an angel of music, sang so beautiful but more than that I'm thinking here about the bridge scene the Music Man and Shirley Jones, wow! She smiled and embraced Robert Preston. Same thing with Gordon McRae in Oklahoma and Carousel. And I recognized immediately that's what we as men, I'm going out on a limb on this. It's just my hypothesis, my two cents worth for whatever, for whatever it's worth. We're trying to recapture that. We want that confirmation, that smile. We want it for ourselves. I think it's probably more powerful than the brute carnality of sex, powerful as that is. I think perhaps uh, Dr. Freud may have missed something here. This confirmation, this acceptance without reservation, without uh, just on a sense of urgency, this mystification, this poetry. You see it, you hear it, uh, your stranger is an amateur singer, but you can hear it in the Hammerstein lyrics, for example. Let's see a, a good one. Uh, there's a song I wanted to do because it's important here. It gets the point. It's slipping, slipping your stranger's mind, but I'll get it. Mm -hmm. Sweet symbols in Isn't it romantic music in the night? A song that can be heard. Isn't it romantic? Moving shadows right. The oldest magic word I hear those breezes Playing in the leaves above While all the world is saying Isn't it romantic merely being young? 
on a lovely June night like this. Isn't it romantic? Every song that's sung, it feels like a lover's kiss. Sweet symbols in the moonlight. Do you mean that I? Chance, isn't it romantic? The evening breeze caresses the leaves tenderly, those trembling leaves embrace the breeze tenderly then you and I came wandering by and lost in a sigh Sure, it was kissed by sea and mist tenderly. I can't forget how two hearts met breathlessly. took my heart so tenderly. These two fine lyrics, the first one, of course, is by the great poet, Mr. Oscar Hammerstein. Let's do one more, just one more to get the point across. South Pacific, Oscar Hammerstein. Some enchanted evening You may see a stranger You may see a stranger Across a crowded room night after night strange as it seems you will see her again again and again in your dreams some enchanted evening you may hear her laughter you may hear her laughter across a crowded room night after night you know even then the sound of her laughter will sing out in your dreams who can explain it who can
can tell you why. Fools give you reasons. Wise men never try. Some enchanted evening when you feel her call you, when you feel her call you across a crowded room, then fly to her side. dream of her love. Oscar Hammerstein, the great poet. Now, I hope those fine lyrics capture the sentiment, what I'm trying to talk about here. I think they're on to a, a basic carnal truth, that romance element. Uh, a lot of us leave that out of our thinking. And I think it's, on, in some sense, more, car more profound and deeper, more primordial than is uh, the carnal sexuality. As vital and as important a component as that is, I think Dr. Freud was correct in a fundamentally in the libido theory, of course, with some modifications. But I think he missed this part. It just it caught me when I saw the great Shirley Jones. You see Elizabeth Taylor and Cat in a Hot Tin Roof. And, and get under, it gets under the skin, huh? And creates a urgency. The Mona, the Mona Lisa smile that haunts. A good example of that, that uh, that type of uh, appeal to that, really to that type of emotion, is Charles Atlas. When Charles Atlas called out to his army of he-men, I'm calling out to you puky puny weaklings out there, you miserable chunks of hideous protoplasm. You are the ones all the women reject romantically. They don't want you in their social presence whatsoever. They don't confirm you. They don't acknowledge you. They don't smile on you. I remember a good example of that. I remember when I was young, I used to go to the Mervyn Griffin show and particularly when Betsy Palmer was there, and Betsy Palmer had a smile that literally lit up the place. It lit up the theater in, in uh, Manhattan, New York. And when she came on, all us guys, we all fought each other, and we each claimed, we each thought Betsy Palmer's smiling on us. Of course, she's just smiling to the crowd in general, and of course, it's a show, it's an entertainment, a show business smile. But we thought in our dreams and our madness and delusions and our overwhelming need, frustration for that Mona Lisa smile. And we thought Betsy Palmer was smiling. I could swear she was smiling just on me. And we all were, in our own world, we all focused on that, we all enjoyed that, and we all took it to insane ex extremes, delusions of grandeur. And we had fantasies about just sitting there and letting Betsy Palmer smile on us, letting uh, Shirley Jones, Oklahoma, Carousel, Music Man, just smile on me, and just absorbing that smile just for myself. Well, Charles Atlas took advantage of this. He said, I'm calling out to my army of he-men. 
I'm calling to you. I'm giving you a chance, you beauty, puny weaklings. The world turns its back on you, ridicules, mocks you, puts you in pillory, puts you in a cage, and blame you for everything. You're the pariah. You're the one who no one wants in a social presence. I'm asking for three months. That's all I want. And I'm going to turn you into a fighting he-man, a man among men. I'll tiger tinsel your lats. I'll armor plate your pecs. I'll dynamite your grip. I'll turn your forearms into mighty tree trunks. I'll columnize your thighs. I'll turn your triceps into huge iron, powerful steel. I'll turn your grip into a magnificent, when you grab something, you got it, you own it. I'll give you brute strength. I'll give you balance. I'll give you coordination. I'll give you aesthetics. Don't just look and admire on my body. Build one of your own. Just do what I did to build my body. Dynamic tension. Three months. Fifteen minutes a day is all it's going to take. And I'll turn your abs into washboards. I'll dynamize and magnetize your will. When you walk down the beach, all the women, all the girls are going to stare and say, Who is this magnificent He-Man? What am I seeing? This God from another world. Look at this. Look at this. It's almost a criminal offense to walk around with a suit of armor, an armor suit of muscle. A suit of hard rock, hard chisel, gut muscle, and the power and the brute power and the will to go along with it. The vitality, the virility. Give me three months, I'm asking for this. And I turn you from your miserable, bukey, bione, weak body into a fighting He-Man. We all bought the dream. We all bought the dream. Well, I can remember when I bought uh, the Charles Atlas course I got from the Superman comics. And Atlas told me to go on a milk diet for one week. Nothing but milk. I drank, are you ready? Four quarts. Over a gallon of milk a day. That's all I did for a week. And then Atlas told me for my beautiful skin for the skin that is so beautiful, smooth, tight and beautiful. I took milk baths, bathed in milk for one week. Dynamic tension, dynamic tension, isometric. Oh man, I wrecked my uh, GI track with all that milk. Oh, Jesus Christ. But I wanted to look like Charles Atlas, the self-proclaimed world's best developed man. He made a fortune on that. Murphy game. Murphy game. We all want to be and Oscar Hammerstein was a master of that in Carousel in Oklahoma in, uh, mu well, not in Music Man, South Pacific. That type of a fantasy. Same thing in, in The Phantom. The same thing in The Phantom. We all wanted to be the hero, Raul, who gets the beautiful Christine Deo, Deor however you pronounce that last name, Christina, in The Phantom of the Opera. But I really identified with The Phantom. Powerful, powerful uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber, the angel of music.
it's very important to shake, to break the chains of addiction to the presence. Don't let that woman or anybody get under your skin predicated on your need for affection and your need for uh, cuddling time, all that bullshit. And particularly your need for that Mona Lisa smile that you never got over. You have to get on your own self-support, self-sufficiency and learn how, whatever it takes to give that to yourself. Otherwise, you'll always be jealous. You'll be stupidly competitive. You'll go out of your capacity, out of your potential, and think you are a god. You have a god entitlement to all of this that uh, Oscar writes about, Oscar Hammerstein, those lyrics I sang. It's all, remember one thing, it's all entertainment. It's all a show out there. It's all showtime. It's all smoking mirrors. See it as a carnival mirror where the figures look so perfect and so compelling and so beautiful. And then reverse that mirror, turn it around and see the other side where the figures are distorted where reality comes crashing through and you have to say then you're forced to admit I could never have this but I say bullshit you have to have substitutes all of life as I see it is vicarious pretense participation one way or another There's a price. Let's call a price for all of this. Put a price on all of this. And we take it from there. That should be the first question. Put a price on all of this. You have to know how to monitor yourself. How to listen to yourself. How to observe yourself and how to do the step back and take a look. Do a reevaluation over and over again where, where you stand, who you are, what you are. So important. You are the king. No, you have to become the king or the master of yourself. But you have to know what that means practically. Not as a pithy saying, not as, as, an, as an, a phony admonishment by those who think they know, but really do not. And lull you into a crazy sense of competition and into a crazy, unending circle of delusions of grandeur which then force you to run a campaign in your mind. And it's all built up on manure, piled up in the Aegean stables of your conditioning. The negative suggestions you're picking up off of yourself. The toughest thing to realize is you're only competing with yourself, and you know, ultimately, that's all it is. Sometimes it takes a lifetime to realize that. And to realize that these lyrics are written by experts and sung by pros who know how to magnetize, hypnotize, mesmerize these emotions of yearning, longing, addiction to the present, hoping, wishing on a star. When you wish upon a star, 
makes no difference who you are. Anything your heart desires will come to you. If your heart is in your dreams, no request is too extreme. When you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. Fate is kind. She brings to those who love the sweet fulfillment of their secret longings. Like a bolt out of the blue. Fate steps in and sees you through. When you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. Now, if you believe the sentiments of that lyric, and if the singer, in this case the stranger, sold it to you, sold the sentiment to you so it gets under your skin, so it burrows under your skin, I've got a Brooklyn Bridge. I'm selling special for you today at a good price. You can't afford to miss. You can't afford to miss out on it. It's the one dollar car on the parking lot. One dollar car, one car on the on parking lot. One dollar, one car. You don't know where it is, you don't know which one it is. Big lines all around the block waiting to get in to the auction to find that one. Everybody's running as soon as those gates open. They camped out all night. As soon as those gates open, everybody's running in all kinds of directions to find that $1 car. It, it's hidden. One car. The other ones are, of course, the regular price. It gets people into the lot. Everybody wants something for nothing. Everybody has larceny in them. That's what makes you vulnerable to the Murphy Man which I've spoken about in other conversations. Adios for now.